Hello everyone and welcome back. It's good to be uh, doing a lecture again for you guys. This is hip differential diagnosis looking at inert tissue disorders. We'll of course be looking at other tissues such as contractile and uh, nervous system to peripheral nerves in the hip and some of the pathologies that happen with that. Those were in later lectures of course. We'll also be looking at post-operative diagnoses with the hip as well. So without further ado, let's get into the inert tissue disorders here. So what are the objectives? Well, we want to understand the following differential diagnoses um, and there's three big areas of inert tissue disorders in the hip, and those would be capsulolabral-related, cartilage-related, or bony-related injuries. So under capsulolabral, we're going to be looking at FAI, or otherwise known as femoroacetabular impingement. We'll also be looking at labral tears, hip dysplasia, and then micro-instability, or sometimes referred to as you know, hip capsular laxity. In terms of cartilage, we'll look at hip osteoarthritis, and then in terms of bony Pathologies will look at femoral neck stress fractures and uh, femoral neck fractures rather and stress fractures of the hip. And so just as a recap on some of the types of inert tissues, we do have joint capsule, cartilaginous tissues, chondral tissues, ligamentous, bony, and there's more. But these are the main ones that we're going to see in the hip that have uh, pathology associated with them. So let's talk about our capsulolabral related pathologies. First up is for more acetabular anatomy review, because we need to understand the anatomy that, to then build upon that to then see how an injury might occur. And so this uh, is an interesting video that's gonna demonstrate the stability, the inert stability, uh, or innate stability rather, of the hip socket. Um, and we'll play this in a second. But the anatomy of the hip joint is quite complex. So you have your coxofemoral and femoral acetabular joints are interchangeable ter terminology. And so, if, for sake of some of the diagnoses, we're going to stick with femoroacetabular. Both describe the articulation between the pelvis and the femur. The femoroacetabular joint is inherently very stable and mobile because it's a ball and socket, right? Um, and di the difference thing about the hip and the shoulder, the shoulder is much more mobile uh, because the glenoid is so shallow. Well, that's not the case in the hip. The acetabulum is very deep, plus you add the labrum onto that and then you get this deep suction effect that occurs so they're trying to pull the hip out of the socket there they can't really got to pull really hard boom pops out you can almost hear that suction effect this video is showing a labral tear how easily uh, the hip loses suction and then here's a labral repair as well so this is just a video review and you know we can watch that one more time here of some of the uh, innate stability of this complex. Very good. So as we move on here, again, you guys can pause these slides and look at this. This is going to look at anatomy, um, bony anatomy of the uh, pelvis and the femur. We'll look at some, uh, obviously, some muscular anatomy as well here in a second, but this is looking at more of the capsule. So we'll talk about like caps, the, the joint capsule of the hip and how that plays a role in function and instability and all those th sorts of things. And then, of course, uh, you know, we're looking at how the capsular labral complex uh, is intimately related with the other structures around. So here we have the, the joint uh, capsule in yellow. You can see on both diagrams highlighted. Then we have the blue, which is going to indicate the labrum. And then you have the femoral head which is not highlighted on the left, but there you have um, the opportunity to see the capsule and labrum. So same video here, you know, you have your inert stabilizers such as your ligaments, joint capsule, labrum, ligamentous teres, and the socket depth. So we'll play that again for you. And then the dynamic stabilizers, these are all the muscles of the hip. We're going to talk a lot, of, a, a lot about them over the course of the three lectures that we go over, so you'll be able to um, learn more about those. But one of the, the big ones I want you to know is the deep six hip rotators. And we'll talk about that more in the contractile lecture as well. So what is FAI? FAI, femoral acetabular impingement, is a syndrome uh, that is increasingly recognized clinical diagnosis for hip pain in young and middle-aged adults secondary to abnormal contact between the femoral head or neck and the acetabular rim. It has been associated with labral tears and chondral damage. The presence of a skiffy, or what we know as a slip capital femoral epiphysis, uh, 
has also been known to cause FAI. There's three types of FAI. Those would be CAM, pincer, and a combination of the two. And we'll go through some pictures of what those look like here and what those terms mean. To diagnose FAI, well, you know, essentials of diagnosis and general considerations here is that it's just dysfunction of the femur and acetabulum where there's increased bony growth due to abnormal contact stress. Uh, otherwise, Wolf's Law comes into play here. The result is that there's uh, increased bony overgrowth, which then can cause impingement and can lead to progressive degenerative changes in the hip joint, uh, especially the labrum. It has been associated with, again, labral and chondral damage. Again, three types, cam, pincer, and a combination. And then excessive acetabular coverage anteriorly may result in premature abutment of the femoral neck. That's an example of a pincer lesion. We'll get into some pictures of that as well. So the demographics here, you're going to think about your younger female patients are most effective, usually in the ages of 15 to 35 years old. Females have a two to one ratio over males. Sports that have repetitive hip flexion with internal rotation, such as hockey, baseball pitcher, on their stride leg when they throw, and other sports also will lead to uh, this diagnosis uh, pretty routinely. Hockey males have this a lot. NFL linemen have this a lot. So just things, something to keep in mind here. So what's the epidemiology of this? Well, general adult population between 10 and 15%. The prevalence of symptomatic athletes is higher than the general population at about 55%. And we talk about symptomatic, we could talk about uh, impingement style tests where it's painful compared to the other leg and compared to other people in the general population. So athletes might have higher rates of impingement symptoms on a clinical exam. The prevalence of an anatomic morphology consistent with this condition in asymptomatic, there is a high prevalence, excuse me, in asymptomatic individuals of what we consider um, abnormal x-rays. And this was reported by Frank et al, which showed a prevalence of 37% of people without symptoms had a CAM defor deformity and 67% uh, of those asymptomatic people had a pincer deformity. So we really try to tie the symptoms to the clinical exam to the imaging to make a diagnosis here. When accounting for the athletic population, a CAM deformity prevalence was about 55% and for, uh, for athletes and 23% for non-athletes. So there's gonna be a much higher rate uh, in the athletic population. Pincher lesions were about 50% of the population uh, and CAM deformity is more prevalent in men than women and pincer lesions are more common in women than men. So those are some nuances, things with the epidemiology demographics to figure out here. So what is a CAM or a pincer lesion? Well, a CAM lesion is an, occurs when there is a structural abnormality of the femur, usually at the femoral neck. It causes a premature abutment of the femur against the acetabular rim, right where the chondrolabral junction is. This deformity causes abnormal contact and then eventually can lead to uh, pain, discomfort, limited motion, especially in hip flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. And if you think uh, arthrokinematically, those three movements go in the same type of roll and glide. So I'll have you kind of review that as well. The pincer lesion, this is an impingement that leads to impaction type injury of the acetabular labrum with degenerative tear patterns there. It's caused by a bony abnormality of the acetabular rim due to an increase in the size of of the acetabular rim because of Wolf's Law, effectively creating a deeper hip socket. Pincer impingements are thought to be more common in middle-aged women participating in athletics, while cam impingement are more common in young male athletes. And a combination of the two can be seen, and that's probably the most likely category actually, seeing a little bit of both. So what do these look like? Well, the picture on the very left is gonna represent a pincer lesion where you have a little bony overgrowth of the uh, anterior superior uh, acetabular rim, a cam lesion in the middle picture, there's going to be bony overgrowth of the femoral neck. And then combined, you'll see on the very right where both areas of the bone have been affected. Again, cam lesions, bony overgrowth on the femoral head or neck and pincer lesions, bony overgrowth on the acetabular rim. So if we look at this diagram, this picture, you can see here's a cam lesion. We have increased bony overgrowth here. You cannot articulate up into the uh, superior, or I guess this would maybe the anterior portion of the joint, um, you can see how it's abutting there. If we go here, you see the neck of the femur, it looks different here. That would, this is a normal femoral neck. This is a, a cam uh, presentation. 
But we do have here in the pincer lesion is an overgrown acetabular rim. And so again, some of these call are, some of these are uh, combination. And this is just denoting there's a involvement of the acetabular labrum in pincer lesions as well. Here's another image. I, I like this image maybe a little better. Uh, you have normal uh, femoral acetabular anatomy. Then you have your bony overgrowth on the femoral neck. And then you have your pincer deformity here uh, on the acetabular rim. Again, another diagram, this one showing uh, with some movement uh, in place here. So you can see repetitive stress into uh, hip flexion is going to probably create uh, bony overgrowth here. And then you get that cam deformity and maybe a labral issue. Similarly, you can have uh, the opposite occur where the acetabular rim has some bony overgrowth. And again, most cases, it's a little bit of both. So what are the signs and symptoms of FAI? The primary symptom of FAI uh, is motion-related or rotational activities and position-related activities that produce pain in the hip or the groin. The pain described is aching, sharp, typically located in the anterior hip or groin or the lateral hip or trochanter area, pain with activities such as squatting, deep hip flexion, hip internal rotation are all things that people complain of. What I've done is put this little red, um, a little crescent uh, highlight over on this guy squatting. That's where people are gonna tell you that they feel pain when they squat or that you're doing hip flexion passively on them. Reports of mechanical symptoms include clicking, catching, locking, stiffness, restricted range, giving away. These are all signs of um, structural damage maybe to the labrum or the capsular labral complex. A common finding is a limitation of hip internal rotation, usually less than 20 degrees, with the hip at 90 degrees of flexion, and a decrease in hip flexion and abduction. Limitations in squatting, lunging, pain with crossing over the legs during functional movements like cutting sports, uh, those are all functional limitations that they might uh, have. So what are the possible contributing causes? Well, risk factors include untreated pediatric hip and pelvis deformities, a family history of FAI, uh, a northern European descent, and participation activities with extreme ranges of motion. And that's probably the most prevalent, uh, and that's why I highlighted that here, or bolded it. Hockey, especially um, goalies, gymnasts, ballet, martial arts, etc. Extreme ranges of motion. Prevalence, we don't know the exact number, but up to 90% of asymptomatic uh, adolescents have at least one radiographic finding, and 50% have two findings. These might be more morphologic, morphologic alterations, and they do not always cause symptoms. So again, you have to tie in clinical exam to imaging uh, to uh, their symptoms here. So differential diagnosis, we're going to think about maybe an isolated labral tear or chondral injury of the hip, osteoarthritis, depending on the age or uh, trauma history, muscle strain or tendinopathy, a lot of muscles uh, cross into the groin, such as the adductors and some of the deep hip flexors. We're going to think maybe uh, differentiating between those. Maybe an inguinal hernia, those would be a little more uh, uh, proximal and to the lower abdomen and maybe not so much deep in the groin. Maybe femoral hernia, a sports hernia, which we'll go over later as well in the contractile lecture, which is known as athletica pubalgia. And then maybe lumbar radiculopathy if you're thinking like an L2, L3 uh, uh, radiculopathy there. So those are things to think about in terms of differential. So how do you test and measure this? Well, it's based on radiology findings, symptoms, and clinical findings, just as I've mentioned previously. Uh, you're going to take them through basically the FADIR test, F-A-D-I-R, right? That's the picture in the top left here. F-A-D-I-R just stands for flexion, adduction, internal rotation. You also have your Faber test, and that's going to be another test you can use for other hip pathologies um, as well. Uh, but this is the FADIR test here. Deep passive hip flexion as well. Squatting greater than 90 degrees causes symptoms. Hip internal rotation at 90 degrees may cause symptoms as well. You want to watch him move and squat. And you can see this picture on the very right, this person squatting, which you'll know. Note with this person, they've offloaded their right leg. They're avoiding deeper hip flexion in the right leg. They're trying to get onto their left leg. And so that could be a common uh, uh, scene movement impairment as they shift over to get away from that side to avoid loading into hip flexion. So how do you treat it? Well, physical therapy is the first line of treatment. PT interventions include lumbopelvic rhythm and lower extremity neuromotor control exercises, gluteal strengthening, hip stretching, focusing mainly on the hip flexors, avoiding impingement positions, activity modifications as needed, 
Three to six months of PT is recommended, but if they fail conservative treatment, surgery may be indicated, such as bony work and a labral repair. Uh, those are the types of surgeries that would help correct this, and we'll go over that in our surgical lecture. All right, next we're gonna talk about a hip labral tear. And so what is this? The etiology is just tears can be degenerative, traumatic, or idiopathic to the mainly the anterior superior uh, labrum. And traumatic labral tears are often, often present with an immediate sharp pain, mechanical symptoms such as catching, locking, or clicking, and a very specific mechanism of injury. Um, in cases of insidious onset, a dull type of pain is described as intermittent sharp pain occurring with certain movements, typically hip internal or external rotation. If you think back to the shoulder lecture, a lot of the pain that happens with labral tears of the shoulder is going to be during extreme ranges of motion or uh, rotational ranges of motion, and you can kind of glean some of that in the hip as well. Extreme ranges or big scouring rotating movements might cause pain if you have a labral tear. So general considerations here, there can be degenerative hip labral tears. Those are closely related to FAI. It's important to realize that FAI and hip labral tears are commonly seen together, but they can be seen also independently of each other. FAI is a bony issue where labral tear is more of a soft tissue issue. And then the prevalence here has been seen to be between 22 and 55% of those in sports with hip pain. And the age of this is variable, but younger could be due to FAI and sports. Middle age may be due to repetitive overuse or degeneration. Really any age, you can have trauma to the hip that can uh, give you a labral tear. Here's an example of a picture on the right. You can see some of the normal labrum here and then how this is uh, injured or torn where the arrows are pointing it out. So are signs and symptoms, anterior groin and hip pain, catching, locking, clicking, feeling stiff or you have limited motion, range of motion of the hip may or may not be limited, but there may be pain at the extreme ranges if the motion is not limited. So location, tears are usually anterior and superior. So that's just where, you know, if you think about FAI, for instance, that's where the abutment of the bony uh, block can come from. And so repetitive stress in the anterior superior acetabulum can then wear down the labrum there and cause an eventual degenerative labral tear. So there you, there you have it. Functional implications, pain with functional activities such as squatting, cutting, running, crossing legs, and many more. Hip FAI and labral tears are very common and they're hard to distinguish on a clinical exam, the difference between the two. Imaging helps us do that. Also mechanism of injury helps us do that. And a lot of times they're just seen together. So you may not be able to differentially diagnose these two independent of each other without something more specific like an MRI. Possible contributing causes, usually cause one of three reasons. FAI or hip dysplasia, so bony abnormalities, repetitive overuse and cutting or twisting sports, and of course, traumatic injury to the hip. Differential diagnosis, I think FAI has to be number one, even though it's not even listed on here. FAI is number one, maybe a contusion, a strain, athletic pubalgia, osteoitis pubis, osteoarthritis, snapping hip syndrome. So I want you guys to look through some of those and see um, the bolded ones are the ones I think are probably the most likely outside of FAI. So what do you do for tests and measures? Well, much like FAI, you're gonna test pretty much the same thing, flexion, adduction, internal rotation of the hip. You may also do passive hyperextension, uh, abduction and external rotation. That's gonna be for posterior pair, uh, posterior tears rather. The patient lays in supine at the edge of the table. Positive finding with this test is apprehension or exquisite pain. Uh, much like if you're thinking doing an apprehension test of the shoulder, they're gonna report some things uh, very similar, pinching and or they just don't want you to go any further. Resisted straight leg raise tests can have a positive effect due to um, stressing the interarticular surfaces uh, of the joint when you are going into a resisted hip flexion moment. And then diagnostic imaging, of course, radiographs for bony abnormalities and then MRI or MRA, as the picture in the bottom right shows, uh, uh, magnetic rena uh, uh, an MRA, <laughs> excuse me, I'm trying to talk too fast here. Magnetic resonance arthrogram to assess soft tissue structures, including the labrum, and that arrow is pointing to a labral tear. In a non-torn lab torn labrum, that will be solid black across the area here. And so that dye has leaked into the tear and is showing you a highlighted area where the tear is uh, in that picture. So what do we do for interventions or treatment? Well, you try to do exercise to maximize your range of motion, strengthening, stability of the hip, and avoid of movements any that place stress on the hip joint. So pain medication may also help. Uh, 
including being injected with a corticosteroid. Um, you know, sometimes these work, sometimes they don't. They're ultrasound guided, so they try to get right to the exact area. And so um, steroid, corticosteroids might be used. Surgery may be indicated, uh, again, if you're not having any um, progress with PT or injections. So I'd have you refer to these two articles at the bottom, of course, our clinical practice guidelines for non-arthritic hip pain. And then uh, this other one by Narvison et al, the management of a patient with acute uh, acetabular labral tear with FAI, with intraarticular steroid injection and a neuromotor training program. There's some good exercises um, in each of these and suggestions for treatment in each of these. So other femoral acetabular conditions of the hip, well, we're looking at hip microinstability, hip dysplasia, and uh, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. So let's start with hip microinstability. This article at the top, first of all, you guys should have access to that. I'm going to upload that to your Canvas. And um, I want you to try to review that if you're studying microinstability of the hip. I think it's a relatively short read. And if you're confused about this information, that will hopefully clear some things up. Some of this information is taken directly from that article. Okay, so what is hip microinstability? Well, it's defined as a painful superphysiological mobility of the hip associating art architectural and functional abnormalities that impair hip stability. So microinstability is represented by excessive femoral head movement within the acetabulum. If you think about this back in the shoulder, you think about your loosey-goosey, high biting index people where the ball uh, moves too much in the, in the, uh, on the glenoid. So in here, it's the same similar condition, but now in the hip complex. Uh, FAI, CAM, or pincer impingement can also induce microinstability just with de degradation over time. Some general considerations here that morphologic bone abnormality can have a strong impact on the function and evolution of the joint. Lack of acetabular coverage can contribute to microinstability. Decreased acetabular coverage on the femur, so you have your ball in your socket, if you have a shallower socket, then by nature you have less stability in the joint. And shallower socket diagnosis is known as hip dysplasia. And we'll talk about that in the next differential diagnosis. So demographics here is the typical patient is a young female adult with sports activity requiring uh, suppleness and extensive ranges of motion such as dancing or gymnast. And so if we continue on here, here's some uh, incredible pictures of uh, some athletes that are in very uh, hyper mobile positions to say the least. These are the people that might experience something like this, and maybe not even these individuals, but there's a spectrum from maybe what I can do to all the way to this, and then anywhere in between can be someone who has microinstability of the hip. So signs and symptoms here. Main symptom is pain, apprehension, or a sensation of instability. Pain is mainly reported in the inguinal fold with progressive onset or else, uh, or else following acute trauma prolonged by sport. Um, to become constant uh, in terms of the pain. The history of the pathology is important as microinstability is diagnosed from a number of different slight abnormalities with slight, uh, or sorry, with uh, specific clinical diastasis. On clinical exam, most microinstability patients show hyperlaxity, which can be assessed on the Biton score. And then uh, that's going to be something I want you guys to review is the Biton index, Biton score. Functional implications here again, pain with repetitive movements, sports, et cetera. This is uh, from the Dangan et al. study that's uh, referenced in the top right corner of this slide, microinstability of the hip, a review, possible contributing causes and differential diagnoses of microinstability. I'm going to let you guys pause it and work through this. So you have microinstability as the diagnosis in the middle, and you can see how a lot of different things can cause uh, this diagnosis, all the way from bone abnormalities, soft tissue abnormalities, to even iatrogenic causes, which means medically induced uh, causes uh, usually accidental. So hip microinstability, we're continuing here with tests and measures diagnosed on uh, your interview, clinical exam and imaging. Various clinical tests have been described to screen for this, but are nonspecific and need to be interpreted in the patient's overall context. These tests include the log roll test, the anterior apprehension test, posterior apprehension test, and the external rotation test. And those are listed in the table on the right hand of the screen. Uh, concomitant diagnosis such as labral lesions or FAI should not be taken as ruling out microinstability, which may be associated. Again, all of these things are closely related. So what do we do for intervention? Well, we 
try to adapt a physical therapy program to stabilize the hip by reinforcing the anterior muscle and tendon structures such as iliopsoas, the adductors, rectus femoris, uh, and uh, generally the hip, uh, glutes, I mean everything. Work on the abductors, also important. They're often weakened in this patient, especially in case of dysplasia. Uh, lumbopelvic control exercises can improve uh, neuromotor control during close chain activities. Maybe soft, uh, a surgical intervention is needed to correct soft tissue or bony abnormalities that is leading to the instability. But um, a lot of times these patients just need PT. So here's the Byton index again. I'll let you pause and review this. It's out of nine points. If you score greater or equal to four out of nine, you're generally uh, considered hypermobile. And then let's get into hip dysplasia. Defines a potentially pathologic undercoverage of the acetabulum on the femur. This is the opposite of a pincer lesion. Displ uh, a dysplastic hip is one that's uh, undercovered rather than a pincer lesion is something that describes overcoverage of the hip. Okay, this can cause instability, pain, and or degeneration, degeneration of the joint over time. It's very common in infants, and there's a there's a um, difference between pediatric or infantile uh, hip dysplasia and adult hip dysplasia. And what I'm going to try to focus on here is more of the adult skeletally mature hip dysplasia here as well. If you go back to this slide, you can see the bottom pictures here. You have normal acetabular coverage of the, of the femoral head, and here's an under coverage. So you guys can see how that would just cause innate uh, instability there. What do we do for tests and measures for hip dysplasia? Well, it's similar to micro instability, so you can go back and review some of that um, because by nature these individuals are unstable. Clinical diagnosis may looking at radiographs in conjunction with the patient's history, signs, symptoms, hip measurements via radiographs. We're looking at things like the alpha angle, neck shaft angle, epiphyseal epif extension, uh, lateral center edge angle. All of these, you guys, you're not going to be really tested on these. Um, these are just good to know, not need to know, uh, that helps you uh, review x-rays and see if there's some of this going on. So for those that are interested in the hip and want to learn more, you can look these up on your own. We'll also talk th about this a little bit in our surgical lecture, um, talking about FAI and things like that. But here's, uh, this is just for your own reference. So Interventions. Well, therapeutic exercise to increase muscular strength and stability around the hip, that's just like micro instability. Because of the anatomical undercoverage of the acetabulum, a periacetabular osteotomy, otherwise known as an, a PAO, is a type of surgery that may be performed to deepen the hip socket. And so essentially what they do is they go in and they fracture the pelvis right here, and they fracture the pelvis right here, and then they shift this over to give you more coverage. So if you look at in relation to the um, superior acetabular rim, we draw a line straight down. You can see where it or in intersects the femur. And after the surgery, you can see where it's now pinned in with all these different screws. Now it has more coverage of the uh, femoral head. You can tell that by the transecting red line. So look that up. It's called a PAO. Look that surgery up. And then what's a skiffy or a slip capital femoral epiphysis? Well, this is a red flag diagnosis, so I just want you guys to take note of that. Um, it's a condition that affects the hip joint in children and adolescents, usually between the ages of 10 and 16 years old, more common in children who are obese or have endocrine disorders such as hypothyroidism, and symptoms of skiffy include pain in the hip or knee, and the knee is bolded because a lot of times these kids will tell you that they have knee pain if it you know, 10 year old tells you they have knee pain, that's not normal. Probably need to look proximal at the hip, especially if you're going to get imaging or refer for imaging. They need to do an image of the hip and the knee in this age group, especially if this um, pain comes on kind of unexpectedly. So, what do we do to test this? Again, we got some imaging that we can do. You can see the pictures on the right here. There's something called Klein's line. That's going to be a transecting line between, you know, right at the top of the femoral neck. And what we want to see is that. Um, there is some uh, on the uh, uh, superior side of that line is going to have some of the femoral head. And if a uh, skiffy, what we might, if you know, when corresponding also to their symptoms, we're not going to see any of the femoral head north of that line. So that's a, that's a way to diagnose it. Here's an example of that. And you can see here's Klein's line on the right hip and on the left hip is very obvious. You can see that femoral head is completely underneath that line. 
and that's a way to diagnose this. And obviously, this is a dislocated, um, or should I say fractured, uh, a joint line there. Fractured jo uh, growth plate, rather. So it slipped uh, the skiffy here with the intervention. What are we doing? Well, surgery is the gold standard. PT should not be done if the hip is unstable. I mean, very unstable, especially, you know, you think about this, you have a fracture. It's not really instability. It's a fracture. It's a fracture of the growth plate. So if you're going to try to do exercises on a hip like this, that's not going to be very good. It's not going to go well. They're going to be stiff. They're going to hardly be able to walk. You want to make sure that you rule this out in that age group before you start doing this. Post-operative PT is very successful. This surgery is very successful because it stabilizes it and these kids heal really well. But this is basically what the surgery looks like. They take a screw or two and put that into the femoral um, uh, neck and then they um, stabilize that. And then there's a period of non or light weight bearing and then you progress over time. You'd get a surgeon's protocol for that. And next, let's look, let's look at uh, bone and cartilage disorders of the hip. We're gonna start with stress fractures and then move all the way to OA. So what is a hip stress fracture? Well, stress fractures result from accelerated bone remodeling in response to repeated stress. You can have stress fractures anywhere in the body really that has a bony, um, a repetitive bony contact. Uh, we see this sometimes in the shoulder. We'll see it in the uh, posterior glenoid of the shoulder or the, uh, the uh, humeral head. We'll also see this in the uh, navicular bone. We'll see this in the cuboid. We'll see this in the calcaneus. We'll see this, of course, in the hip, as we're going to talk about here. There's a lot of different areas where you can have a repetitive stress injury or bony stress reaction. One of the biggest areas actually is the shin, right, the tibia. You can have a tibial stress reaction as well, and that's going to be, you know, from repetitive impact. So uh, basically what happens here is there, you know, this is a tension or a uh, stress-induced tension or compression-induced injury. And so what I've done here is put a picture on the right uh, where we're looking at the bone configuration in the hip and how the trabecular bone uh, is configured in the proximal femur and why it's configured like that. Well, it's to be able to take stress and load in various angles. And so uh, this is just an this is where usually stress fractures will happen is in the superior part of the femur. And so knowing how the bone is structured and how load goes through the bone is important to understand how these injuries occur. And so if you need to, you can pause and um, you can pause and look at this picture more in depth. But um, this is just some of the deeper anatomy to some of this stuff. So the picture on the right, this is the exact type of person that I would expect to have um, a hip stress fracture is going to be a you know young adult female who trains very long distances running um, and so you know they're generally classified as fatigue or insufficiency fractures fatigue stress fractures are caused by repetitive and abnormally high forces from muscle action or weight bearing torques often found a person with normal bone act uh, bone mineral densities and this stress fracture at the hip is most common in athletes involved in intense training including military personnel and, of course, people like the um, uh, picture demonstrates here. Insufficiency stress fractures are associated with individuals who have compromised bone density. And so, you know, we can start, start talking about um, what we call as REDS, Relative Energy Deficiency um, Syndrome, I believe. I think the S stands for something else, actually. But REDS, you can look that up as well. That's going to be, it, usually, it used to be called a female athlete triad. But um, males also suffer from this as well. But we're talking about um, nutrition intake, uh, uh, kind of the psychology about body image, um, training intensities, uh, all these sorts of things where you're not getting the proper nutrition because you think being thinner or uh, smaller is beneficial for your sport. And thus you're, you compromise your bone health and your tissue health. And then when you do all that, repetitive loading, then you can set yourself up for more bony injuries. So demographics here, statistically significant risk factor for lower extremity stress factors identified in the Waterman et al. study were female sex, age group greater than or equal to 40 and greater than or, or less than or equal to 20. And then Caucasian athletes as well as female sex has greatest influence on femoral neck stress fractures. So the picture on the right is an embodiment of those demographics.
So what are signs and symptoms? Well, you have an onset of sudden pain, usually associated with a recent change in training, such as increase in distance or intensity or a change in training surface. Location can be deep, lateral, or diffuse. The earliest and most frequent symptom is pain deep in the thigh, inguinal area, or anterior groin. Pain can also occur in the lateral or anteromedial aspect of the thigh. Um, it can radiate down to the knee. Less uh, severe cases may only have pain following a long run, right, where you get that repetitive uh, overuse. Uh, maybe a one-mile run doesn't hurt, but an eight-mile run does. Night pain occurs if the fracture progresses and gets worse. Pain with functional movements, uh, especially repetitive and or impact activities, are the biggest functional implications or limitations. So what are possible contributing causes? Again, we this is uh, just pasted from the previous slide. You have fatigue, stress fractures from training, uh, uh, poor training, and then you have insufficiency fractures from compromised bone densities, and then you really can have a combination of both. If you have poor bone mineral health and you train a lot, you're setting yourself up for disaster. Differential diagnosis here, hip OA, referred symptoms from the spine, trochanteric bursitis, septic arthritis. Some of these are a little uh, a stretch. Uh, when you get the subjective history, you'll be able to start really trying to tease this out. And then demographics, we've already talked about this. Runners or military cadets, female greater than male. Tests and measures, you know, you may be able to uh, do this on a clinical exam where you do something called the lever, the fulcrum test. And it's best, uh, you know, basically what you do is you put your hand under the person's, uh, the middle of their thigh, and then you push down on their knee as they're sitting on the table and you're gonna get this kind of a levering effect uh, in the femur. And, you know, the hope is that maybe you stress this to the point where uh, you're noticing some discomfort in the proximal hip. This test is not described for uh, stress fractures. This is this test is typically described for mid bone uh, femoral shaft fractures. Okay, so if you're wondering if someone has a femoral shaft fracture and they don't have a big deformity, and you go and you push on their leg like this, it's probably going to hurt if they have a fracture without a deformity. So you know this is kind of a stretch for a stress fracture, but something that you may be able to do. Um, but usually their subjective history is going to tell you a lot about um, uh, their training volume and things like that. And so a clinical test uh, might be better, like you know blood work and uh, MRI. You know this picture on the right is an MRI that shows the femoral neck stress fracture here. So what you can see is the actual crack in the bone, but then all this white around uh, shows you inflammation of the surrounding bone. So what do you do? Well, you you just you don't run. <laughs> you know, I mean, you got to you got to change your training volume for these cases. So, um, you know, if you do have a stress fracture, there may be a period of non weight bearing. Uh, you're going to dial in your, your nutrition. You're going to dial in your sleep. You're going to probably get with a dietitian. Um, there may be uh, a reason to get in with sports psychology here if there's a body image issue. So um, these are all, you know, eventually when the hip is pain free during normal walking and range of motion, then you can probably start loading it again. Think of your bone tissue healing timelines and that's going to help drive your treatment. All right, let's talk about proximal femur fractures. Uh, these are tough. These are really tough. So proximal hip fractures, different than a stress fracture, right? This is going to be due to a trauma. Proximal femur fracture due to a trauma. Stress fractures are due to repetitive overuse, okay? Big difference there in differential diagnosis. Also, the age at which these happen, much, much different. So make sure that you're dialed in with that for the final exam. So proximal hip fractures is defined as a fracture of the proximal third of the femur orthopedic problem with the highest incidence, cost, and risk. This is a big deal. The morbidity rates after uh, proximal femoral fractures are 20 to 30%. So you just picture that. If you fracture your hip, you're going to have a likelihood of <laughs> dying of 20 to 30%. I think it's within five years. Okay, so we'll look at the data um, here in the slide, uh, a couple slides here. Hip fractures are associated with substantial morbidity and mortality in the elderly. And 90% um, of hip fractures result from a simple low energy fall. So this is going into why and how important it is to prevent falls and how physical therapists can be at the forefront of doing that. The most common risk factors for falls and thus hip fractures are age, gender, race, institutionalization, hospitalization, medical comorbidities such as cardiac disease, stroke, dementia, poor hip fracture uh, or poor hip healing maybe, osteoporosis, hip geometry, so maybe their bony anatomy, 
medication, bone density, diet, smoking, alcohol consumption, fluorinated water, urban versus rural residents, and climate. All of those have some sort of um, implication on rates of hip fractures. And so you can look into the uh, literature on maybe why those are, okay? Here's a couple of great studies uh, looking at uh, mortality and hip fractures. So one year mortality follow-up, uh, Schnell et al. 2011, uh, basically 21.2% of those people, um, you know, they died. Men versus women, 27% of men and 19% of women respectively, mortality rate for the initial inpatient hospital stay. So this is just, hey, they fractured their hip, now they're in the hospital, 3% of them died, right? So the people that made it out of the hospital, 21% of those people died. So you have one in five people dying at one year after a hip fracture. And like we said, if we go back one slide, if you look at all the risk factors, these are old, unhealthy individuals with poor bone healing potential and probably weren't getting along, uh, uh, getting up and moving well anyways. So they, you know, are they dying from a hip fracture? No, they're dying from probably pneumonia that gets set in after they fall and fracture hip and then are non-mobile and are dependent. And so that's probably where they die from is more pneumonia induced um, inactivity uh, instead of uh, the actual hip fracture itself. But it's so debilitating, then that leads to that, right? So this is why we try to prevent it. Hip fracture reduced life expectancy by almost two years in another study by Braithwaite et al. in 2003. 25% decreased in life expectancy compared with an age and sex match general population. 17% of remaining life was spent in a nursing facility. So how horrible is this? Fracture your hip and you're young, relatively young, say so you're 76, you fracture your hip. Outside of fracturing your hip, maybe you're gonna you know, live several more years in, uh, at home. Well, 20% of those people now are gonna be in a nursing facility just because they fracture their hip. It's pretty, it's pretty um, important to stop these from happening. So what's the absolute risk of death by this last study? Estimates were present for an 80-year-old individual with hip fracture. For one, two, five, and 10-year post-fracture, the absolute mortality risk for women was eight, 11, 18, and 22%, and for men was 18, 22, 26, and 20%. So women generally do better um, when they're older, and maybe that's because women are generally healthier than old men. But you can see at one year in this study, at one year out, 18% uh, of those individuals died. At two years out, 22. At five years, uh, the other quarter, 26. And then at 10 years, 20%. So we're talking about someone who may be 90 years old. How many people are living to 90? Not very many. So are some of this just secondary to getting old? or does hip fracture have something to do with their mortality? So proximal femur fractures, the general considerations here is there's a couple different types, okay? Intratrochanteric and subtrochanteric, and also femoral neck. We'll have pictures of those later. Demographics, elderly, and we're talking not young elderly like 60, but most common in 75 plus year olds. Poor bone mineral density, patients with fall risk. Younger patients may have a, um, Proximal femur fracture, if they participate in high speed, risky activities. We're talking about things like X Games, motocross, any racing, driving sports, um, even football to some extent, um, things where you're having big collisions. With the rising life expectancy, it is estimated that the incidence of hip fracture will rise from 1.6 million in 1990 to 6.26 million in 2050. And so that's, you know, six times what it was in 1990. And just because of, you know, the aging population, baby boomer, boomers and um, uh, Gen X. Yeah, those two individuals. So proximal femur fractures, signs and symptoms. Uh, well, they're, you're going to find somebody on the floor, okay? They're going to have an inability to get up um, from a fall. Or if you do get them up, they'll be in excruciating pain and they won't be able to walk. They'll have severe pain in their hip or groin. And we're talking about, you know, picture you walk into a room as a PT and you see someone on the floor and they're writhing in pain. The first thing you should think about is, okay, they're breathing, they have circulation, they've got sensation. Okay, so why are they on the floor? They didn't have a heart condition. They didn't have a stroke or anything like that. Okay, they, did they fall? Okay, yes. Um, can they get up? No. All right, let's get other medical personnel in here to help. Maybe this person fractured their hip. 
Okay, you're gonna see a deformity in these individuals with a shorter leg on the side of the injured hip. If you picture that proximal femur is fractured, then um, it will shorten because the bones are not in the right spot. Outward turning of the leg on the injured hips, so they'll assume this externally rotated position. They'll be unable to perform any functional activities such as rolling, sitting up, scooting. I mean, they're gonna be really dependent and they're gonna be a lot of pain. Extreme fear avoidance or pain with moving or being moved. So these are sometimes tough to move these individuals. I've had to help with one of these cases on an inpatient rotation uh, in PT school in a neuro hospital. And uh, it, was, it wasn't fun and I do remember it uh, still, uh, whatever, 11, 12 years later. So possible contributing causes. Again, we've kind of talked about this, but poor balance, osteoporosis, malnutrition, that would you know uh, impair bone mineral density, decreased physical activity, impaired vision, neurological diseases, altered reflexes, muscle atrophy. Differential diagnoses should include avascular necrosis, uh, acetabular pelvic fracture, mid-shaft femur fracture, uh, maybe a full thickness muscle tear from a trauma. Also, you're just gonna confirm this with, with radiographs, but you can see how on that bottom right picture of the x-ray, how the femoral, uh, the, the femur is uh, in the trochanteric area is fractured and how that would actually uh, create more of a caudal um, or cranial rather uh, shift of the femur so that the, that leg would be shorter if you're just observing them. And then the picture on the top right, you know, there's this old commercial and it shows these people falling, they have life alert. And um, the reason that is so important, life alert is so uh, important, is because uh, if someone is living alone, like a widow, and they do fall and they fracture their hip, you know, these are the cases that you hear on the news where, you know, neighbors haven't seen, uh, you know, old Joyce in, you know, two weeks, and then they do a wellness check. And, you know, unfortunately, she's passed away because she hasn't been able to get up um, on her own or get to a phone. Um, and, you know, these are, these are tragic cases but um, that's what that company was designed to do, um, is create a lanyard that has a emergency help button. Now most people, I assume, would be carrying their cell phone with them, um, but uh, then again, some of these fall risk people would probably be good to have a life alert. These are the types of proximal hip fractures, so you know, I'm gonna let you pause here and look through these. They're all treated relatively the same in terms of physical therapy goes uh, post-operatively, so, um, We'll go into that in the post-op lecture later, but here's some surgical interventions. You can look at these. We'll dive into this uh, later as well. So next, let's go to the big dog of this lecture, which is osteoarthritis of the hip. OA of the hip is a disease of the entire joint complex and the surrounding musculature uh, is one of many causes of the hip in groin pain in older adults. And so um, while I say this, it is the entire joint complex and the surrounding musculature. Hip OA is not actually a muscular disorder, right? It's actually a chondral disorder, a cartilage, uh, cartilaginous disorder. But what it does is it affects all the tissues around the shoulder because of the impairments that it causes. Okay, so OA is characterized by progressive biomechanical joint changes, including degeneration and loss of articular cartilage, joint capsule contracture, loss of periarticular flexibility, and increased intracapsular pressure because of effusion most common in ages of 60 plus. Signs and symptoms here, moderate anterior lateral hip pain with weight bearing activities, morning stiffness lasting longer than one hour, hip internal rotation, um, range of motion less than 24 degrees or hip internal rotation and flexion 15 degrees less than the contralateral hip, increased pain with passive hip internal rotation, and then they may demonstrate what's called the C sign, which is the picture on the top right, where they take their hand like a C and they put that kind of around their um, anterolateral hip there. Uh, that's where they would be feeling pain. Pain with functional activities such as squatting, crossing legs, walking, impact activities. And here I'm gonna have you guys refer to the clinical practice guidelines of hip pain and mobility deficits, the hip OA revision 2017 article. What are possible contributing causes and demographics here? Well, older age, someone who's maybe obese, their genetics, like if someone had, um, you know, uh, like a long family history of early onset osteoarthritis, there seems to be maybe a genetic component to that. Repetitive stress and mechanical overloading, farmers, construction workers, you know, any laborers that have been working for several, several decades, high impact sports, acetabular display, uh, displastic history, FAI history, skiffy history. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but there's something called leg calf perthes disease. Uh, you guys can look that one up. Uh, it's a little more 
Um, it's another pediatric disorder, but uh, you guys can look that up. If you had a history of that, that might increase your chance of OA. And of course, trauma, if you had a hip dislocation or hip fracture previously. So differential diagnosis. Well, here's the list, and this is from a Wright et al. study titled Differential Diagnosis Early Management of Rapidly Progressing Hip Pain in 59-Year-Old Male. This is a case study, and so they talked about all these different types of differential diagnoses in that case study. So what do we do to test and measure this? You, you don't need a radiograph. However, physicians probably would tell you you do um, to stage it, but there are clinical practice guidelines established by physical therapists to help determine this um, diagnosis without imaging, okay? And both of these um, uh, clinical prediction guidelines or uh, clinical practice guidelines are going to be listed in the two articles on the right side of your screen. So from the 2017 JOSPT clinical practice guideline, there are five things um, that will help you determine this. There's six bullets, but there's really five things on your clinical exam. We talked about this in the previous slide. Moderate anterior lateral hip pain with weight bearing, morning stiffness more than one hour, hip internal rotation, range of motion less than 24 degrees as an absolute measurement, and then internal and hip flexion range of motion less than 15 degrees of the non-painful side, increased hip pain associated with passive hip internal rotation, and then the sixth one here is absence of history, activity limitations, or impairments inconsistent with hip OA. Then the Sutlib et al. clinical practice or clinical prediction rule, rather the CPR, there's five variables as well, and they're very similar to the ones in the JOSPT clinical practice guideline. One is self-reported squatting as an aggregating, aggregating factor. Two, active hip flexion causing lateral hip pain. Three, hip quadrant testing, that'd be like a scour test with adduction causing lateral hip or groin pain, active hip extension causing pain, and then passive internal rotation of less than or equal to 25 degrees. So you can see in the JOSPT version versus the Sutliv version, about 24, 25 degrees of hip internal rotation on the affected side might be an indicator. So in the Sutliv et al. CPR, if there were three out of five variables present, the chance of having OA is almost 70%. With four or five out of five, the chance is increased to 91%. So these are clinical practice guidelines that will, or clinical prediction rules rather, uh, those two, you know, you can see clinical practice guideline, clinical prediction rule. I get those interchanged sometimes, but clinical uh, prediction rule is just something that's gonna help you diagnose something with higher likelihood ratios, okay? So if you have three or four of these variables, you very well, uh, the, the odds that you have a patient with hip OA is much higher. Here's some interventions you can do. This is straight out of the JOSPT clinical practice guideline. So you can pause and look at these or review that article for hip OA interventions. What do you do for hip OA as a treatment? Well, if it's um, severe enough, you might do a hip a replacement, total hip arthroplasty. We'll talk about this in the surgical lecture. Thank you guys for sitting in. It's a little longer lectures, probably the longest of the three. Um, appreciate you guys and uh, let's get after it.